Might just have to get set up a bit here. Oh, cool. All right, great. Um, so, I'm Simon. I work in the code search team at Facebook. I'm going to tell you about a system that we've been building over the last year called Gleam. So Gleam is, uh, has been built by the, the three people here. So uh, my two collaborators, Roman and Chris, have uh, also worked on it. I want to make sure they get as much blame as me for this. So what's the motivation? Well, so in your IDE, if your IDE understands your source code at a semantic level and not just a textual level, we can do lots of interesting things like you, know, you can jump to the definition of a function from a call type to a function. You can find all the places your, your functions are being called. You can, do, you can navigate the class structure of your, of your program. You may be able to do things like manage the imports and the namespaces. And in some IDs, you can even go as far as having refactoring tools that will do type safe refactoring on your code across multiple parts of the code base. So we can do lots of interesting things if we understand the structure. And in your code search tooling, understanding the structure is really important as well, because you can do things like finding exactly the definition of a function that you're searching for, and not just places where that text occurs in the code base. Or you might be able to find all of the classes that inherit from a class that you're looking at. Or maybe places that call a function at a particular overloading, something that you couldn't do very easily with just tools that look at the text. Uh, and then, if you have good code search tooling, that can serve as a gateway to a code exploration experience that lets you navigate through the code base in a semantic way. So these are the kind of things that we think are interesting. Uh, so having rich code metadata gives you a better IDE experience, a better code search experience, better navigation experience, potentially. But also, if you have lots of metadata about your code, then you might be able to build analysis tools that work over that metadata without having to parse and type check the code every time you want to do an analysis. So we think these are all interesting use cases that we want to support. But going a bit further, so imagine if you had just a single place to put all of the metadata about your code. You're going to store it in one place. Then there are other kinds of information about the code that you might want to put there too. Things like your test coverage data, or your static analysis results, if you've got analysis that runs over your code base. Uh, churn data, how much your code is changing, how many bugs you've had in a particular area of the code. All of these things you might be able to put in one place and then do interesting uh, searches, interesting queries that combine information from these different kinds of sources. And so not only putting that in one place, but having it across all of your different languages and systems that, that make up your software ecosystem. So being able to uh, track a data flow through your front end and your back end and other services that call it, having information in one place would let you do that kind of thing. So the traditional methods for having metadata about your code are the things like in your IDE, you know, when you load up your project in Xcode or IntelliJ or Eclipse or whatever you use, it will go and analyze the code and it will build up some information about the metadata and use that to, to let you navigate. Um, there are also tools that analyze the code base and, and store some data. I'm thinking of things like Google that we have for Haskell, for example, looks over the code, builds a database that it uses to support searching. Um, and there are various good code exploration tools that you can find. Uh, one that springs to mind in particular is the Chromium one, which is a really nice navigation experience for Chromium. Um, but none of these things are particularly integrated, and they're, they all sort of work uh, well, the, the IDEs in particular work locally on your, on your machine. Um, and the sort of looming problem that we have to deal with is that code bases are getting larger. So this is a, a nice graphic that comes from Information is Beautiful. Uh, and you can see that you know, code bases used to be quite small. Unix was 10,000 lines when it was uh, Unix version 1. And nowadays, a million lines of code is not an unusual thing. So. The size of typical code bases today, you have things like the Large Hadron Collider at uh, 50 million lines of code. Facebook allegedly has 62 million lines of code. I can't comment. Um, and many other code bases are in the tens of millions of lines of code. Right? This is not an unusual thing these days. Um, so the size of the code base that our IDE is going to have to understand is getting too large. And maybe you think, well, the bit that I'm working on is pretty small. I, I only need to understand these few source files that I'm working on. But nowadays, you can pull in dependencies really easily. Right? So your language probably has a package manager that lets you, with a couple of lines, add in a new dependency on something on GitHub. 
Um, so we can use more and more dependencies much more easily. And we would like to have metadata about those dependencies too. We would like to be able to understand the APIs that we're calling and to maybe even go through the APIs and understand what the implementation is doing. Uh, and overall, our stacks are getting larger. You know, your dependencies are adding more dependencies and so on. So the, the whole stack of code that you're working on is probably quite large. And so at Facebook, we actually advocate putting all of your code into a single repository that we call a mono repo. And many other big tech companies are doing this too. And we even put lots of effort into source control tooling that makes having a large mono repo with all of your code in it uh, an efficient thing to work with. And it turns out this is a really effective way to, to move fast when you're developing, because it means you can make changes across the whole code base atomically. And it means you don't have to coordinate changes between multiple repos and have a versioning problem. Um, but again, having all of your code in one place gives your metadata tooling a bit of a problem. So the local code metadata, so uh, building metadata locally in your IDE or whatever tooling you're using isn't really scaling to these kind of huge use cases that we have. So maybe we could have some system that computes that offline and gives you a, a database that you can download onto your system. There are IDEs that work like that today. Um, but it's still going to be big, and you need multiple versions of that database corresponding to every revision of the repository, right? And not only that, but you want versions of the database correspond to, corresponding to diffs that you're working on or merge requests that you're working on, right? So you have to combine the local changes with all of these different revisions of the repository that you're working with. So it's not just the size of things, but it's also the rate of change and the frequency of change that we have to worry about. <coughs> so this brings me to Gleam, which is a system we are building which has the goal of eventually solving these problems. I'm not going to pretend that we've solved the problems at this point in time, but we think it's a, it's a promising approach. So I'm not going to tell you about what we've done. So Glean is our system for collecting, deriving, storing, and querying facts about code. We started the project about a year ago. Uh, we are very much planning to open source it. Uh, we're not quite at that stage yet, but it's, um, it's definitely a goal we have. And we're being very careful about what dependencies we take on so that we can uh, ensure that we can open source it. Um, it's still very much work in progress. I'll tell you today about what we've done so far, but there will be lots of pieces that we haven't quite filled in yet. Uh, but we think it's uh, what we have so far and what we plan to open source it still has many useful use cases. So the, the sort of high level design of the system is this diagram here, which you're going to see lots of throughout this talk. Uh, so we have a code base on the right. This is the, the code that we're trying to understand. The system is going to deduce facts about the code, okay, where a fact can be whatever you like, you know, something you can deduce by looking at the source code. So it can be things like the location of declarations. It can be cross-references between call sites and, the, and the, the definition they're calling. It can be types. It can be static analysis results. It can be anything you can deduce from the source code. And this data in the form of facts is going to be collected by Glean and stored in a database somewhere. So one principle that we're thinking about with this system is that the, the code base is really the source of truth, right? So code, code base is where the data is, essentially. And we're just going to cache some information about that in Glean. So this means that we could, in principle, throw away the cache and recompute it if we lost it. We can compute parts of it on demand if, uh, if there are parts that we know are expensive to compute or we know that we're only going to, to need them rarely. We might compute them on demand. Provided we have the source code, we can always go back and recompute those things. So another thing we realized when we started thinking about this was that we don't want to build front ends for all the languages we need to understand, right? So good front ends already exist in library form for many of the languages that we want to use. So for example, C++ has been uh, a big focus for us so far. And we really just want to use Clang as our front end, right? We don't want to have to build another C++ front end. That's, that's something that would take us several years, probably. Uh, and the same goes for many of these other front ends and languages. So we want to be able to build the tooling that we call indexes, uh, the, the systems that understand the code and produce the facts. These things should use the native libraries and, uh, and front ends for the existing languages. 
So we're going to have many of these indexes that understand source code. They will probably be external programs. And they're going to need to send information in the form of facts to Glean. So Glean will need to have some kind of language independent API for doing that. And looking at the other end of the system, so the clients of Glean are these systems like IDEs, like analysis tools, code search, code navigation, all of these kind of things will be able to get the metadata about the code they need to understand by making queries to Glean. And Glean will get the facts from its database. So thinking about the, the problem I mentioned earlier about uh, what happens when you have many versions of your code that you need to understand. Well, the facts that Glean is storing in its database are just immutable things, right? So that means that we can have incremental additions to a database that just add more facts or delete existing facts. So our eventual vision for this is that we'll be able to support multiple versions of the repository by having incremental databases that store changes to the facts. So the next question to think about is how much detail are we going to store about our code? Now, different use cases need different amounts of detail. So things like IDEs and code search tooling don't really care too much about what language, or many of the features that we want to use don't care too much about what language you're using. Uh, jumping to a function definition is the same regardless of what language you're using. So we would like IDEs to work across all our languages very easily without having to implement language-specific stuff in the IDE. Um, but when we get to things like static analysis tools, these, uh, these kind of things need much more detailed language-specific information about the code they're looking at. So in order to support static analysis, we would like to have full language-dependent information. So this gives us uh, an issue. How do we support these different uh, levels of abstraction in the same system? Um, so the solution we came up with is that, uh, well, we obviously have to collect the most detailed information if we want to have that available. But we can derive higher levels of abstraction on top of that. And the idea that we came back to that gave us a way of doing this is, uh, is data log. I don't know how many of you are familiar with data log, but uh, so it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a form of prologue that's suitable for storing data as, as facts. And here's an example. So this is just syntax I made up. This is not clean syntax. This is just a fantasy data log that I'm using to, to illustrate the idea. Um, so bicycle here is a predicate, and uh, bicycle uh, has two facts. So we know that a road bike is a bicycle, and a mountain bike is a bicycle. Maybe controversial, I'm not sure. Uh, we also know that a hatchback is a car and an SUV is a car. So these are two predicates. And then if we want to talk about just modes of transport, so if you have an application that doesn't care about the details of bicycles and cars and what other forms of transport you have, we could write a rule that says X is a transport if either X is a car or X is a bicycle. So we have information here at two levels of detail. We have the most specific information about you know, the kinds of bicycle and the kinds of car. And we have a higher level abstraction for modes of transport that don't say anything about the particular kinds of transport that we have. And you could imagine using this idea for metadata about code. So suppose instead of bicycle, we had C++ declaration. Instead of car, we had Java declaration. And then we could talk about declarations in general. Right, without talking about the details of what language we're talking about. So this is the basis of the idea behind data log. We think data log will give us uh, the ability to represent different levels of abstraction in our data. It's also going to let us represent complex data structures, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, with type safety. And because facts are immutable things, we're just adding data to the database. It will let us support incrementality too. So just to get really concrete, I'd like to give you a, a little tour of Glean, what it's like to use Glean, using the actual syntax and, and showing you what the actual tools do. So in order to do that, I, I've made a little functional language that we're going to pretend that we're using, and we're going to index this language in Glean. So our little fantasy functional language has variables, which are represented by strings, has operators, plus, minus, and so on, declarations of the form variable equals expression, and our expressions are probably very familiar to you. We have variables, numbers, lambda expressions, if then else conditionals. Uh, this one here is function application. Oh, no. 
I can't use my pointer. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, we have function application and infix operator application. So in order to put the data into Gleam, we need to tell Gleam what the schema of our data is. And the schema is represented by a set of predicates. So let's start with variables. So we define a predicate for a variable like this, and it has four components. So we're defining a predicate. It has the name, which we're going to call example.var. It has a version, because we're going to support evolution of the types in our schema. I won't say much more about that. Um, probably the most important thing here is the, the type of data that we're going to store in the facts of example.var, which we call the key type. And here the type is just a string, so variables are represented by strings. And some documentation. So just to summarize, a schema is a set of predicates, where you can think of a predicate as a type, just a, a type in your language. And a fact is an instance of that type. So some item of data that satisfies a predicate is what we call a fact. Uh, just a note on the sy syntax here, this is actually a Python DSL. Not for any particularly good reasons, just it, it happened to be a convenient thing at the time. Um, in principle, it could be anything, because so Gleam works with a concrete representation of the schema. So you can compile, you could make a DSL in whatever favorite language you have. Uh, okay, and let's look at some actual data. So we're using JSON here for the time being. Um, but this is a couple of facts of our predicate that we made, example.var. So we have two facts uh, saying that we have variables x and y. So the representation here is that uh, a fact is a JSON record with a, with a key field, and then the, the value of the key field is a thing of the type uh, of the, the key type of the predicate, which here is a string. OK. Why is it in JSON? Well, um, I'm going to tell you a bit more about that later, but uh, JSON is really just for experimenting and testing. It's so that we can have some concrete syntax that we can use to talk about facts and things. Uh, there is actually a much more efficient binary representation that we use for real applications. So Glean has a shell. You can just start up the shell in, in your terminal, and you can play around with things. So um, here I, I've loaded that JSON file that I showed you on the last slide and created a database from it. So now we can have a look at what's in our database with this stat command. And the stat command shows you for each of the different predicates, how many facts do we have of that predicate, and how many bytes are those taking up. So here we have two variables, and it's taking up 66 bytes. We can do little queries in the shell. So this query is just uh, a query for all of the facts of the predicate example.var, and it's showed us two facts there, so the two facts. Uh, showing us variables x and y. And you can see that Glean has added IDs to these facts. So every fact in the database has a unique ID that you can use to refer to it. Okay, and we can actually look up a fact by its ID. And that gives us back the fact. Okay, so we've only done variables so far. What about the rest of the syntax? Well, let's look at declarations. So this is uh, the predicate for a declaration called example.decl. And now we have a more interesting type. So the key type here is a, needs to have two fields. So we need to have the variable and the right-hand side, the expression. So we've used a record type and the square brackets here with the list of fields inside gives us a, a record type. And we have two fields, name and RHS for right-hand side. So the interesting thing here is that we've just referred directly to the predicate for the value of this field. So this is perhaps a bit unusual if you're used to databases where you would normally have to have an ID that you, you refer to things by their ID. And that's what's going on underneath. Like Glean is referring to other facts by ID. But it, as far as possible, it, it, it tries to hide that from you. So it's just giving you the impression that you're talking about nested data structures. So there's a straightforward mapping between how you would define the AST for this language and how you define the predicates for it in Glean. Uh, operators. So for an operator, I didn't use a predicate here. I just used a type. So um, 
So a predicate is a thing that you can search for, it's a thing that has an ID, whereas a type is just some inline data that we're going to be able to represent. Uh, so uh, an operator here is just an enumerated type with two values, plus and minus, and you could add more, of course. And what do expressions look like? Well, the interesting thing about expressions is that this is a recursive type. So in our DSL, that means we have to declare it before we use it. So the first line here is declaring the expression type, and then defining the expression type. The interesting thing here is that we are using a union type or a sum type. So we have both records and sum types, and numbers and uh, various base types and so on. So there's a fairly rich type language that we can use. Uh, so the union type has all the different possibilities for the expression type. And again, some of these have square brackets, so they have records as their argument. Okay, so just quickly, I'm not going to go into full detail here about how this is represented, but you could make the, the data that corresponds to the expression landrex.x and represent that in JSON over here uh, using the schema. So you can see here that we've got a fact of type expression, that's why it has a key, and then uh, it's a lambda with two fields, arg and body, and the rest of it represents the expression. And we can load that into lean and we can see what we've got. Well, we have two facts of the predicate expression, so that corresponds to the two sub-expressions that we have, a lambda and a variable, and we have one variable. Why do we have one variable? We actually had x in two places here, but what happens is that Glean will common up identical facts. So there's only one variable called x, as far as Glean is concerned. Okay, and then we can do some slightly more complicated queries. So here we can do a query for all of the expressions of the form lam, and this is giving back the one result for that sub-expression. So just to summarize what we've got so far, so Glean is suitable for storing uh, nested data in the form of syntax trees. Um, and it has this rich type language. So we have base types, we have records, we have union types, uh, we have enumerations and so on. And as you insert data into the database, Glean is going to type check that data and deduplicate any identical facts. But we use JSON. JSON is pretty horrible, right? But it, it's sort of this concrete syntax that uh, every, everything understands, you, you have lots of tooling that you can use with it. Um, but it's very large and slow to process, and it's not going to get us to our goal of being able to deal with this data at scale. And it's not very much fun to program with, because you, it, there's no type safety. So what we really want here are some kind of types. So for, for writing programs that interact with Glean data, we would like to be able to use real native types in the language that we're programming with. Um, but we want to use many different languages. As I mentioned earlier, we're writing indexes in C++ and Python and Java and uh, using our native libraries. So we need to interact with Glean in many different languages. Uh, and we don't want to have to generate types. You know, we, we could do some code generation for every language, but uh, that would be a lot of work. So instead what we did is we uh, wrote a translator from the schema that you tell Glean about, so the definition of your types into thrift types. And so for those of you who don't know what thrift is, thrift is this language independent way of expressing types that you can then compile into native types in many different languages. So we generate thrift types just once. And you can see there's a fairly straightforward translation here. So for every fact, we generate a struct in thrift, thrift which is going to have an ID and a key type. And the key type here is represented by another struct just a straightforward mapping of the record that we defined in our predicate over to a record in Thrift. Okay, that's the key corresponding to our record. And one interesting thing here is that we have an optional key type. So what, why is this optional? This corresponds to nullable or maybe or you know uh, whatever optional feature you have in the language. But why do we? Why does the key need to be optional? Well, if you think about the structures that we're trying to talk about here, we have some sort of nested structures in the database corresponding to the AST for our programming language. And we want to be able to, to talk about just parts of that structure. So you want to be able to do queries for particular kinds of expression. And you probably don't want to pull the whole of the data you know, for that expression. You probably just want to look at part of it. So in order to be able to represent just part of a tree, 
we're going to need to have outgoing pointers which are null or maybe or nothing or, uh, or are not there for some reason. So that's why we have optional in all of the predicate types uh, in thrift. Okay, so now we have thrift types. So that's the thrift types on the left. What can we do? Well, we can generate from thrift, we can generate native Haskell types. These are the Haskell types that we would get from those thrift types. And we can do that for all the other languages that we want to use. So we can generate Python types and PHP types. Uh, and we get to talk about Glean data in a sort of native way in all the languages that we want to use. So going back to JSON, so we had this JSON syntax that I talked about earlier. Um, the JSON syntax was not invented, it just happens to be the serialization of those thrift types. So given some thrift data structure, you can serialize it using the thrift library. And then you will get some, you can serialize it into binary or JSON. Uh, and the JSON syntax we use is just the serialization of the thrift types. So there was nothing particularly magic about the JSON syntax that we, we invented. Um, and we have to have some concrete syntax, so that's why I've been using JSON. Perhaps in the future we'll have a more data log style, uh, perhaps a more concise concrete syntax, but this is the way things are for now. So let's see what it's like to actually write an index for our simple language. Uh, and as I mentioned, we want to build on an existing front end. So let's imagine that for this little language we're writing a, we have a Haskell library uh, with a data type for its abstract syntax tree that looks like this. And we want to walk over the syntax for this, this language and generate facts in Gleam for it. So this is how we would generate a fact for a variable. If we have a function index var, it takes a var, this is the internal abstract syntax, and it's, uh, there's a monad called fact builder. And fact builder is going to build a fact and return the type example.var. So the example.var is the thrift type that we generated from the, the Glean schema. So index var is taking a name as an argument. It's calling an API glean.makefact with a constructor for example.var. And the last argument there is just the value that we want to store in that fact. So it's a very straightforward you know, translation of the, uh, of the AST. Uh, and we walk over it and we call makefact to make all the facts. Um, so looking at how we do declarations, so this function index decal takes a, uh, an instance of the decal type in the abstract syntax and it just recursively walks over it. So we call index var on, var on the variable, we call index expr on the expression, and then we make a fact corresponding to the decal. So there's nothing particularly magic here, we're just sort of walking over the AST and, and calling make fact to make each of the facts. And if we do that on an example, so we, let's imagine we have an example uh, of the factorial function. We could walk over that and we can generate some data. It didn't quite fit on the slide, it's a bit small here, so sorry about that. But uh, this is the, the JSON that you would get by indexing that factorial function. And if we look at the data in Glean in the shell, we can see that we have 10 sub-expressions and the total size was 360 bytes. So it's actually a, a fairly compact representation. I'll talk a bit about the representation shortly. So, uh, yeah, I want to go back to this issue of commoning up um, identical facts. So, back in the lambda x dot x example, we had two mentions of the variable x, and they both got the same ID. So, if you look in the output from Glean, it's telling you we have two variables x, and they both have ID 1125. So, it's common those up. And in general, as you add facts to the database, Glean is going to common up identical facts. And since we're building nested structures, it will common them up all the way up the tree. So you end up with maximal sharing of all of the subtrees that you add to the database. And this is really useful for doing indexing at scale. So imagine we're trying to index our very large code base of, let's say, C++. Uh, and we want to parallelize this to make it as fast as possible. So we have multiple indexing processes that are all looking at different source files and putting the data into Glean. So we're parallelizing it. And they're sending nested data structures over to Glean. So now, imagine you're indexing a C++ file and it includes some header file that includes some other header file that has some declaration in it. 
So it's very likely that multiple of these indexer processes are going to discover the same declarations in the header files. So they're going to end up sending the same data over to Glean for the same facts. And this is where commoning up of that data is very useful because even when multiple indexer processes all discover the declaration of printf, say, in, the, in a header file somewhere, that will get commoned up in the, in the representation of the data in the database. And that's all very well. That works, that works fine. Um, but we would rather not send over all of the data every time for all of these repeated declarations. So a natural thing to do seems to be to try and cache some of that data in the indexer process. So we're going to cache some of the data that we've seen, and that means we can avoid sending over repeated trees back to Gleam. But if we're caching data in all of the processes, they have to agree on what the IDs of those of that cache data is. Because when we send something to Gleam, it might get commoned up with something, so we don't know the ID of it until we've actually inserted it into the database. So the way this works is that Gleam is going to have to send back a substitution telling us what the IDs of those facts that we wanted to insert in the database are. And that way we can make sure that the caches stored on each of the indexes are in sync with each other. Uh, and they all have the same idea of what the, the IDs of these facts are. So what this process means is that we can actually index our entire code base uh, at Facebook, all of the C++ code, all of the Objective-C code that we have, uh, in a matter of hours with a handful of machines. And that's pretty fast, actually. We, we found that the bottleneck is um, mainly doing the C++ front-end processing. So all of the stuff that the Clang front-end has to do when you ask for the AST of a, of a file, has to parse and type check and explore all the header files, that tends to be the bottleneck. OK, so I said I was going to talk about the, uh, the data representation. So a fact in Gleam is represented by its ID, its type, which identifies the predicate, and a binary serialized representation of the key type. OK, so all of the data here in the predicate is in the key. And for an example, imagine we have this uh, a fact of the, the variable predicate that I mentioned earlier on. So we have the, uh, it has an ID, it has a key, which is a string, and the representation of this internally would be this blob here where we have the ID first, we have uh, an integer corresponding to the predicate, and then we have a serialized representation of the string. And if we had a record type, then we serialize that by just concatenating the serializations of the fields. And if we have a representation that includes um, Rep it includes referring to another fact in another predicate, then the representation of that is just the ID of the fact that we're referring to. So in this uh, lambda example here, we have an arg and a body. Those are two references to other facts, so we just uh, represent the IDs of those concatenated together. Um, and in general, so we, we've thrown away the field names here, and we're serializing strings as UTF-8. Um, so because we're throwing away the field names, what that means is that there's no type information in the serialized representation. Uh, so we're actually going to need to know the types in order to deserialize it. So anything that understands the data is going to have to know the full, uh, the full schema. OK, and having so serialized our representation, we now have um, uh, the database stores two mappings that lets us access this data. So it has a mapping from ID that gives us back the type and the key. And it has a mapping from type and key that gives us back the ID. And these two tables have different purposes. So the, the ID mapping lets us traverse structures. So if we start from one fact, we can deserialize its representation. It will refer to some other facts, and then we can look those up in the table and so forth. The other mapping from type and key to ID lets us search for facts of a particular key. So that's going to let us start our traversal by identifying a particular fact, and then we can expand the fact using the ID table. Um, there's some similarities here with how relational databases work. So relational DB will have a set of rows, and then it will have a primary key that you can look up, uh, look up by key and give you back a row. Uh, so there's some similarity here. But we want to go a little bit further than just looking up things by exact key. So in Datalog, we would like to be able to 
to have patterns that match a set of facts. So for example, we can have a query example.var that returns all of the predicates, all of the facts of the example.var predicate. And we can have a query that matches all of the expressions of the form lambda x dot something. So in general, we'd like to be able to scan the data for facts that match a particular pattern. So here's how this works. We've built our backend based on RocksDB. So RocksDB uh, lets you implement a mapping. And it represents that mapping as a tree, a try. In our case, the try is going to look a bit like this, where the first layer of the try is the type of the, that the type being the predicate. And the second layer of the try is going to be the first byte of the key. The, second, uh, the next layer of the try will be the second byte of the key, and so on, uh, all the way down. So what this representation means is that if we have uh, a pattern that has a known prefix, so for example, we want to search for facts of the form where the type is 1 and the first byte of the key is b, then that will give us a path through the try, identifying all of the facts that have that prefix. And then we can return all of the facts within the key space underneath that point in the try. So that works well. But if we don't know a prefix, if we only know a suffix, then the search that we would have to do for all those facts covers a much larger space within the try. So if we only knew the suffix here, where the suffix is x, we would have to search everything underneath 1 in the try for all of the facts that match that pattern. So this has implications for how we design our predicates, because we can search very efficiently for things that have a prefix, uh, a prefix pattern. Uh, and that means we want to put fields that we want to search for at the beginning of the predicate. So in our declaration predicate here, we had a name in an RHS field. So that means we can search for declarations by name, but we can't very easily search for declarations by expression, because that would be a suffix. So imagine we wanted to search for all of the declarations in a particular file. A natural thing to do would be to add a file field to our predicate. So if we added the file field as the second field, that wouldn't let us be able to, uh, that wouldn't let us efficient, efficiently search for all of the declarations in a particular file because it wouldn't be a prefix. And we could flip those two fields around. We could put file first and name second, but then we couldn't search for declarations by name. So what's the solution to this? Well, we can define another predicate. Let's call it example um, dot decal by file, which has two fields, the file, and it points to the declaration. So now, using this predicate, we can search for all the declarations in a particular file. And what have we done here? We haven't added any new information to the database. All we've done is derived more information based on what was already there. But we've made it more efficient to do certain kinds of query. So there's a parallel here with what we do in relational DBs, where we add a secondary key. And adding a secondary key makes the database build an index for that key. So here is, what we've done here is basically build an index for another key uh, that lets us find declarations for a particular file. Uh, and this is an instance of what we call a derived predicate. So it's just deriving more information. And in general, your data log lets you derive information uh, using rules for, um, uh, for any of the data in your database. So here's one other design uh, decision. So there are various design things that come up when you're trying to work with predicates. But here's another example. So on the left here, we have the predicate that I just showed, which lets us find all the declarations for a file. On the right is another representation for that. So for a file, we can get back an array of all the declarations in that file. So on the right, there's only going to be one fact for each file, whereas on the left, there's going to be many facts for each file. And there's a trade-off between these two different things. So on the right, there's lower storage overhead because we don't have a separate predicate with a separate ID for every mapping between file and decal. Um, however, there might be less sharing on the right because if we had multiple instances of a file, if we'd sort of looked at a file under different contexts such that it had a different set of declarations, they wouldn't be shared as, uh, shared as efficiently as they would be on the left. And it doesn't let you do certain kinds of query. Right, so you can't say, is there a decal foo in the file bar.h? You can do that very easily with the, the version on the left, but not so easily with the version on the right. So we found this trade-off 
um, to be something that we've had to experiment quite a lot with, with the, the kinds of types that we've been defining. So I want to mention very quickly the applications that so far we're using Glean for at Facebook. So we have, um, have a code browser that lets you navigate C++ and Objective-C code and gives you hyperlinks, uh, lets you see all the references um, for a particular function and jump to where it's defined, which might be many places. Uh, we're supporting some IDE features. We're also looking at static analysis, in particular looking for dead code by analyzing the, just the offline Glean data that we have and writing analysis on that. So just to summarize, so we had Glean, which is this uh, storage engine and query engine for, um, for arbitrary data types. We're actually using it for, for code, but in general, it's, it's suitable for storing any kind of nested data structures. Uh, there's an efficient data representation because we're de designing this specifically with the goal of being able to index things at scale. So we use efficient binary representations for things. Um, the, the schema compiles into a type-safe API that you can use in many different languages. And we're already using that in at least three or four different languages. Uh, the query API, which I haven't had time to talk to you about today, but there's, there's a query API which lets you specify patterns in the form of nested expressions that you'd like to match, and also lets you fetch, uh, fetch data to various depths within a single query. Uh, we're working on incremental databases and uh, also the data log style rules that let you represent things at different levels of abstraction. It's something else that we're working on. And it is my hope that we will be able to open source this very soon. Thank you very much. So we have some minutes for questions. Um, and what we're going to do is, because this is being recorded, we can, if you can raise your hand, uh, we can run over to you with the microphone, and you can ask the question. So anybody have any questions? Yeah. Hey, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so it, it seems like a couple of the design decisions that you made have a severe influence on which queries will be supported efficiently rather than inefficiently. I mean, you've shown how you can add indexes manually. Another thing I wondered about is, since you do maximal sharing, that means you can't have parent pointers, right? You cannot identify the parent item in an AST. So if I wanted to know if a certain variable occurs in the specific function, how would I do that? Or is that hmm. ruled out? Right. Um, so a similar thing comes up when you're trying to talk about cross-references, right? Because you're uh, the occurrence of the variable wants to point di directly back to the declaration that it refers to, and that, that's um, something that we're doing. Um, but the way we're implementing it is that, uh, so you, you first of all index all the data, so in, with, a, with the forward pointers, and then you can derive information from that data to give you the back pointers. Right? So Glean doesn't let you have cycles in the data, but what it does let you do is have predicates that have edges in both directions, if you like. Um, so the way that works is that we, we build up all the data uh, in one direction and then we do a, a separate pass that walks over all of it and collects the data um, that gives you the, the back pointers. Uh, so I think that would let you do what you want. Stephen Pemberton, uh, CWI Amsterdam. Um, so uh, there, there seems to be an assumption that, that's, that type, type systems from different languages are all mappable onto one, uh, one form. but. Is that really true? I mean, if I think, uh, let's say, how arrays are handled in JSON against uh, XML, then they're not exactly mappable. Um, OK, so, so the point you're making is that uh, we have to squash all of our types into a particular type scheme. Uh, and that's very true, right? Um, so that the... Uh, the schema that Glean lets you use has record types and union types and, uh, and a few base types and things. Um, so yes, it's true. You say that that's the lowest common denominator, but it's a pretty flexible one. And there's quite a lot that you can do within that. Uh, and then we compile that into thrift types, um, which again is, is perhaps not what you would write natively in your language if you were defining the types. Uh, but this is unfortunately the price you pay for having to represent your data once and use in many different languages. So you're saying it's, 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 nevertheless, it's still possible. 
the yes, it's, it's still possible. We haven't found anything that you couldn't represent yet. So some of this work reminds me of a uh, language server protocol or language service protocol, whichever it is, uh, in the sense of sort of reusing facts from different languages and being able to sort of reuse the different analyses over those languages. Is there a relationship between those two works or is there a way to merge these efforts? Yeah, yeah. So, so language server protocol is, is the, uh, typically used by IDEs as a way to, uh, to let you navigate the code in the IDE. Um, so it, it tends to be, uh, my understanding is that it's language uh, independent. Right, so you, you can it has it support things like jumping to definitions and, and navigating relationships within the source code. Um, so you could imagine using the uh, the idea of representing your data at different levels of abstraction to to give you a language server protocol view of the more detailed data that we have in Glean. That's the long term vision that we have is that we'll have very detailed language specific data but then you could talk about it using the kind of terms that you see in language server protocol if you want to just by having derived rules on top of that. So Denis Mirna from SourceD, uh, you mentioned that you have um, like a backward index in the database so you index by type and by expression but how do you exactly deal with uh, shadowing for example for variables? Do you have some specific naming scheme for it? Sorry, could you repeat it? Did you say shadowing? Shadowing. Shadowing? Yeah, shadowing by variable name, for example. So you have the type of okay. variable and you have a name. So basically, what I'm asking is, do you have some specific scheme to express this, like the scoping? Uh, shadowing. Well, if you're representing variables by names, then, then shadowing is an artifact of the representation. Uh, but if you want to represent variables by something that has some, some way to identify particular instances, then you could, um, it, it, and again, it comes down to how much detail do you want to have in your representation, right? So if you just have names, then you get shadowing. Uh, but you could also have a more detailed representation that let you have a, an, accurate, an accurate relationship between variable occurrences and the definition. Hi, Jeremy Gibbons. Uh, you've showed us about uh, the indexing process sending uh, partial indices across to a server that get amalgamated there and then having to synchronize back with the amalgamated I identifiers. That that's, seems to me rather like a union find kind of problem. You could do it all on the server side. It could all be one way and you'd have less synchronization to mess around with. Did you try that? Did that not work? Um, yes, there's a bit of a trade-off here. So uh, uh, you can tweak various variables like how often do you want to send back the substitution from the server uh, and uh, how, how big a cache do you want to have on the, the clients and so on. And you're right, I mean, you could go to one extreme and not have any cache at all, or you could, uh, um, admittedly, we haven't played around with this, the variables very much to find out where the optimum is, but um, uh, yeah. Uh, hi. So, as far as I understand, Gleaners augments existing like code bases across languages, projects, runtimes with queryability. And can you see a future where the, there is like clean line uh, capabilities in built into like runtimes and code bases? Uh, built into runtimes and code bases. Well, um, so what we hope is that eventually uh, the, the Glean ecosystem will evolve so that we have indexes for all the main languages that you would want to use. Um, and that's, that's kind of our ambition is when, when we open source this, that people will contribute indexes for their languages based on the, probably their existing uh, ASTs and front-end libraries. Um, whether the Glean will be built into code bases and runtimes, I, I'm not sure what the motivation for that would be. I mean, not having a pro separate, for example, a separate indexing process that indexes a code base, but oh, a see. runtime being aware of the classes and types it runs and being able to query the runtime and a way to store our code right. base that will be aware of what it stores and then being able to store this code store. Um, sure. Uh, so. Uh, since we're using, in many cases, the compiler front end for, 
for the languages that we're indexing. You could imagine um, if you're running the compiler, uh, perhaps you're running a, a REPL or something, and the REPL could send data directly to Dlean. So that level of integration is certainly possible, I think. Um, so um, thanks for the talk. I'm just wondering, one particularly useful kind of fact is uh, about code is what happened when it ran. So is, is that in scope, something about testing or dynamic analysis? Is that part of your vision? Um, yeah, so I, I deliberately didn't talk about things that y you might want to store about the code that, uh, that are not directly derived from the code itself, because so r runtime can be non-deterministic. So you could imagine storing things like profiling results or uh, uh, you know, any kind of uh, data that you can derive from when the program runs. Um, so these things are, uh, are not things that you can derive by looking at the code itself, right? You have to do more stuff. Uh, so in that sense, Glee would not be just a cache, it would be more of a, a data store. Um, but certainly those things are useful, so I, I, maybe we'll end up doing that in the, in the future, I don't know. So you showed two kind of facts. One is purely source code, uh, like AST, and then the second the one you added information about source files. I wonder, uh, in your experience, did you use any other kind of facts, maybe about libraries that the code uses or something else? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I didn't fully get that. So uh, the source facts about the code that you showed in, on the slides were of two kinds. One is just uh, AST, right? Like variable, declaration, expression. Right. And then uh, you added an example where you store information about the file where code is defined. Right. Uh, so are there any other kinds of source facts that you used? So like uh, about libraries that the code uses or maybe extensions or something like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's completely up to you how much detail you want to store about the source code that you have. Uh, the AST is one obvious thing, but there are different levels of AST. So you can have just the, uh, the, the textual AST where variable names are just names, or you can have an AST that has types in it, uh, or an AST that has um, exact cross-references between variables and declarations. Um, and then there can be information on top of that. So one of the things that we're storing is uh, information about the build system. So not only what source files you have, but what libraries they belong to, what packages they belong to, and the relationships between those and dependencies and so on. Um, so yes, I mean, you, you can go to a higher level um, than the source code, and you can talk about collections of source code and, and structure that you have there. Um, we have two more questions um, in the queue, and then we're going to break for coffee, because we're, uh, we're running down the time. So I'm going to pass it up. Hi, I'm Peter Conte from Recruit Communications. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm interested about the incrementally aspect, incrementality aspect you talked about. So, uh, uh, is your vision, um, does your vision contain kind of the ability to uh, have kind of semantic, semantic understanding over diffs, or is it just going to kind of re-derive the facts over different uh, commits? all over again. I'm thinking about something like refactoring and changing names of stuff and things like that. Yes. Um, well, so uh, what you would hope is that when you have a, a delta to the code base, that uh, the view of that, of the complete code base with your delta included would be the same as you know when your delta has been applied and you've done the complete in indexing on the whole code base. Um, so incrementality is just a more efficient way of getting to that point, really. Uh, so you want to avoid re-indexing the parts of the code base that haven't changed. So there needs to be some way to understand what the dependencies are. And then there needs to be some way to represent a delta to the, to the database in terms of facts that we remove and facts that we add. Um, so the, we're not giving you any new functionality. That, that's the idea. It's, it's just that there will be a more efficient way to represent the complete index of the code base. Uh, my question was about cross-language um, facts, like FFI calls or remote procedure calls. Right. Um, do you have any plans, thoughts about how you might go about representing those kinds of information? 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely, that's something that we definitely want to do. Uh, I mean, at, at a basic level, you could imagine having full detail information about the two languages that are talking to each other, and then making some connection via queries between the call and, and where, what it's calling. Uh, you probably want to have some um, some process during indexing of the code bases that makes that connection between the call and the code that it's calling. And then you could make queries that traverse that edge in the graph. Uh, uh, and then maybe you want to have some higher level way of viewing that. But I, I think all of these things are possible and we've, we've experimented with doing it on, on some particular examples like I mentioned Thrift and Thrift is something that we use heavily at Facebook. So we'd like to be able to uh, to go from a thrift definition of an RPC call to the code that implements that, right? And we started doing some experiments to uh, to, to represent data structures that let you make that query. So let's thank uh, Simon.